Uh, my name is uh, Walter T. Oka. I was born in Hawaii, May 29, 1928. I'm the youngest of 13 and the youngest of uh, nine brothers. Uh, the one above, above me uh, died when he was two months old, so there are eight of us left. And <clears throat> my parents, uh, <clears throat> my father came to uh, Hawaii way back in uh, 1898 as a young 18 year old trying to make a fortune and make enough money to go back to Japan and fly by himself a nice farm and live happily ever after. But after 10 years in Hawaii, his uh, future wife joined him in 1908. And in 1909, my oldest brother was born. And since then, it was a succession of kids. And the age difference between my brother and I are 18 years old. So there's the big span there. Now, in terms of my <clears throat> Uh, experience as growing up in Hawaii, uh, just like any kid growing up, even though there was a depression, I guess my mom was uh, very good in pooling the money that my brothers and uh, father made and provided us with uh, food that I didn't really suffer from depression in a, in a sense of a grown up. Uh, I had plenty to eat and what have you. I didn't starve. Uh, my brothers, and later on, uh, I went with him to go fishing in Pearl Harbor, catch a lot of uh, mullets and mackerels and those things. So we had a lot of fish to eat and dig clams and those things. So that's essentially my growing up and went to uh, a great, from first grade to ninth grade at Aya grade school and from there went to transfer to a high school about five miles away called White Power High School, which I graduated in 1946. So uh, that's essentially a, a sketch of my then, <clears throat> uh, let's put it this way, uh, sitting <clears throat> uh, because four, four of my siblings and my father worked for the sugar plantation there. When they vacated the uh, uh, Aya Hospital, which sat on a bluff overlooking Pearl Harbor, uh, the ward section was populated by single Filipino workers and the nurses' corps was given to us. So <clears throat> we uh, lived there. In terms of rental, etc., you work for the plantation, they provide you housing. And so whatever money that's made, uh, we could eke out a life and by going fishing and clamming, etc., would supplement uh, the food. So uh, maybe my brothers and my parents probably felt uh, like what it's to live in depression, but uh, as a kid, I guess I was, uh, I had no concern on that. Now in, 19, <clears throat> in 1940s or even 39, uh, the Navy uh, used to come in and out. Um, so as they came into Pearl Harbor from the porch, we used to watch the ship come in. And they usually, many, many ships would come in. So we should stand on the porch and watch that coming in. In 1940, <clears throat> Admiral uh, Richardson was uh, sent from, President uh, Roosevelt ordered uh, Admiral Kimmel to move the Pacific Fleet from San Diego to Hawaii. So the whole fleet of the Pacific Fleet used Pearl Harbor as the base. And then in the beginning, he separated half of the fleet to be outside of Maui, Lahaina, which is deep water and the rest came into Pearl Harbor. Then as the conflict increased out in the east with Japan invading Manchuria and invading China, escalating the conflict, uh, Richardson decided that he better bring in the fleet to Pearl Harbor because if anywhere was sunk out in Lahaina, Maui, 
it's deep water, so they would have trouble salvaging any of the ship that might sink over there. So as they start to come in, they go out to sea during the weekdays, and on Friday the fleet starts to come in. So I used to watch the destroyers come in, followed by the cruisers, by the supply ships, the battleships, and finally the aircraft carrier. So this is something that every weekend I used to like I have nothing else to do. It just fascinated me, so I watched them coming in. Then on Sunday morning, the Air Force, Army Air Force, flew in formation over the battleships on Fort Island and did their general maneuver of spiraling in formation and do a dive bombing attack on the battleships. And uh, we used to watch, oh, we used to watch that from the porch. So when December 7th came, uh, <clears throat> we were in the living room listening to the radio, and when I heard the roar of airplanes and explosions, we ran out to the porch. Uh, two of my brothers and two sisters and my father went, went out to the porch to watch what, what was happening. So I, as I saw this formation <clears throat> flying, <clears throat> over the battleships, dive bombing, dropping their bombs and explosion occurring and what have you. My brother saw the torpedo plane come at low level, dropping the torpedoes, and then the explosion that ensued from that attack. Uh, first thing as a 13 and a half year old kid came to my mind is, man, the Army is really mad at the Navy, they're dropping real bombs. And I said, how, how could, you know, how could they do that? And then later on, when the f plane flew over the house and I saw the red insignia of the Japanese uh, army, or the Japanese uh, symbol of the Japanese flag, then I realized that the Japanese uh, did the attacking. And watching the formation, et cetera, it's really, surreal when the explosion takes place and then you see the fire and even after 30 minutes of the attack when they flew away a lot of the uh, battleship was still exploding from ammunitions or gasoline or what have you so then there's a not a intense explosion but every now and then you can hear boom boom then 30 minutes later another by this time, the, the ships were burning, so you can see dark column of uh, uh, smoke rising up in the air, heading toward the sea. Then when the second attack came by, the Navy evidently <clears throat> had their guns prepared so that you could see anti-aircraft puff explosion in the skies and see some of it plane get hit directly and burst in flame and crashing and some were damaged and you can see it going in flame and uh, hit the, uh, the sea so that uh, I, I didn't count numbers in terms of uh, how many planes got shot down but there's quite a few of them that were shot down and still the explosion taking place so uh, this time you could hear a lot of machine gun fire uh, fly, uh, shooting at the plane so that in one moment uh, when the machine gun bullets hit the roof uh, we just noticed that but n never thought of uh, being afraid or what have you because the sight that we're seeing was so spectacular that uh, you couldn't think of anything else. Now, in retrospect, in the first attack, the first thing that I saw was on the far side of the island, I guess that would be like a northwest side of the island, where the USS Utah, Cunning Tower, started to lean towards, and gave you the idea it was capsizing. Then as that was happening, on the left side, on Battleship Row, I started to see the Oklahoma doing the same thing, 
tilting and all of a sudden you can see the thing bottoms up so you see the hull of the ship and then as soon as that happened there's a horrendous explosion that took place evidently the, the Japanese dive bomber dropped the bomb and hit a magazine of the uh, USS Arizona so that the, the explosion was really horrendous and then the feeling or oh, the sound that I can think of is cop and as that thing occurred, about a few seconds later, the shock wave of the explosion hit your chest and moved you backwards, maybe about an inch or two. And that was all you can say was like, "Whoa!" And you can see this massive uh, clouds shooting up and flames bursting and all that stuff. So that's in the first attack. The second attack, as it occurred. Later on, I found out the explosion was on a, a destroyer called USS Shaw. And then that's the pic picture that you see a lot in magazines and what have you. It's really like a big fireworks that took place in one big bang. The sound was not as loud as the one from Arizona. And the destroyer was maybe another half mile farther from uh, the Arizona, so the concussion or the shock wave, uh, we didn't feel any of that thing. So after all this mayhem going on, et cetera, all of a sudden it became quiet again and the plane flew away. And then every now and then you can see, you can hear explosions here and there. And now you can see rescue ships or so little gigs coming by, picking up uh, sailors that were thrown off the ship and what have you. And then you can see uh, tugboats with hoses trying to quilt the fire. So that's essentially uh, my experience of seeing what uh, Pearl Harbor was like, which isn't too much except for the 13-year-old kid. It's like, wow. Now, after the attack, uh, there was a radio broadcast uh, saying that all ROTC students from the University of Hawaii report back to the university and my brother David was a freshman at the university. So as a land grant uh, university, the first two years you have to be in the ROTC program. So he reported uh, <clears throat> to the uh, university and became part of the 298-299 Territorial Guard on National Guard. And eight weeks later, he came home. And I said, oh, you got a furlough? He said, oh, no. He said, he, he was released. And in fact, all of the Japanese Americans that were in, the, those that were drafted as well from the uh, ROTC, were relieved of the command because they were Japs. Uh, somehow, a general from uh, the mainland came in and I guess he saw these little Japanese soldiers in American uniform and said, and having rifle and light ammunition, he said, we better disarm them and corral them. So that's what happened. So he was kind of mad about the thing and, and wasn't too happy about it. Then uh, eight weeks, I think, uh, after the attack, all Japanese Americans uh, were reclassified from A1. A1 means that you uh, qualify to be drafted or and <clears throat> that was relabeled 4C. Here you're an American and you're labeled an enemy alien and you no longer can, can uh, serve in the uh, armed forces and what have you work in any um, government facility because uh, you're a suspect. So <clears throat> about that evening after the attack, a sailor from the USS Arizona who claims to have been on deck and got blown off the ship into the water and survived. And then a Marine from the USS Oklahoma happened to be on deck. So as it capsized, he jumped into the water and saved himself. And the both of them came to our house because my brother <clears throat> was a ham operator. He had a shortwave set 
as well as a, a audio system that he used to communicate throughout the world. And they used postcard <coughs> to set dates up. So if you were from Germany, you put down the date and what time. So once in a while, about one, two o'clock in the morning, I used to join my brother and listen to what he was doing. And, and because <coughs> he was a suspect, a uh, Japanese with shortwave radio, the, the two military personnel came to uh, guard it until it was removed. Both of them were, in spite of that, and knowing they were Japanese, they, they were very friendly and uh, we conversed a lot. But, and I don't know where they slept or, or ate <clears throat> because they were there about a couple of days until the radio was taken away. My brother happened to be uh, north of the island uh, with his uh, wife's family, so they, they couldn't interview him and what have you. And later, the FBI interrogated him, and many, many months later, he was reimbursed uh, for the uh, radio that they took away. About two or three days later, uh, two FBI agents came to the house. I wasn't home, but my brother, Haruto, was home. And they asked uh, to see uh, uh, Walter Roca. Uh, evidently, he knew too much about the ships and they wanted to interview him. So they happened to see a family picture on the wall and asked my brother which one of those is Walter. And he pointed to the little boy in the picture. And my brother's, uh, re at least what he relayed to me, he said they were kind of disgusted and left because <laughs> they thought they might have found a prize or something like that. And the reason I think they found my information is because uh, before the attack on weekends and etc., I used to hang around the pier I appear with the sailors used to embark to go on liberty. And I used to shine shoes and I used to sell newspaper and chewing gum when they came on shore. And I collected as many match covers of the ships uh, as I could. So I, I used to study the match covers with a silhouette of the ships and the sailors would tell me where they were anchored and what have you. So, you know, that was uh, my curiosity at that age. And after the FBI came, my parents said, I better get rid of those uh, match covers. So I got rid of it. And in retrospect, man, that would have been fortune today. But that's the way it is. Then uh, that evening, uh, curfew was ex extended and martial law was extended. So after sundown, you couldn't put any lights on. Then. The uh, ensuing week, uh, they gave directions as to how to uh, construct a shield on your window so that you can turn your lights out without having any re reflection from the air. So that's the way we live. And ration took place like any place, so that your sugar, uh, meat, and anything else is rationed. And you had coupons that you use. And if you ran out of coupon, you have to wait for the next month to get your ration. And uh, we still went to school. Uh, like <clears throat> most Japanese kids in our community, uh, we went to English school from morning till about 1.30. And then after 1.30, those that the Catholics went to a Catholic uh, church to get their uh, catechism and then the Japanese went to a Japanese language school, which I attended, and I did study uh, kendo. Uh, for those that n don't know what kendo is, it's one where you put on a face mask, and army, uh, little armor here with paddings, and had a bamboo, split bamboo stick that you beat each other with. Uh, other, there's another uh, Japanese school that they specialized in judo, which uh, they took judo there while we did kendo. And then we competed with various uh, Japanese schools throughout the island in tournaments and what have you. So that's 
when the war started, that was all desist. You said you couldn't do that anymore. So what we did was play touch football and all those other things that kids would do. Uh, we didn't have any soccer, so I never heard of soccer growing up. But we did a lot of baseball and did uh, football without any uh, padding or anything. It was kind of risky because you uh, could have easily broken your bone or something like that. So growing up, <clears throat> uh, after the war, they issued the gas masks. They had a lot, lot of drills of air raid and putting on gas masks. And they used tear gas to simulate an attack so you have time to put it on. And if you failed, then uh, you suffered with uh, burning eyes. <laughs> So as far as I was concerned, it was kind of mundane in that you did, and when I went to high school, you had your baseball, football, basketball. I played football. I didn't make the team for baseball, but I made the team for football. Here's a 120-pound guard. <laughs> and then basketball, I wasn't good enough, so I became a manager of the team. And we traveled inter-island playing each other, so. That was my experience growing up. And then, uh, as far as my brothers in Mar uh, March, March of 1943, uh, there was a call by the Army asking for Japanese Americans to volunteer to become part of the uh, 442nd Regimental Team that they were forming. And evidently, they tried <clears throat> to recruit the uh, the men from the tent concentration camps that Roosevelt uh, ordered them to be put into, and somehow they only got about 1,200. So they came to Hawaii and asked for volunteers, and about 10,000 uh, Japanese American volunteered, and then 2,600 were selected, and then three of my brothers happened to be lucky with the lottery and they joined the full 42nd and, and they went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi for training and later sent to Africa uh, and from Africa went into uh, Salerno, Italy and fought up uh, Italy until they were transferred to southern France and went up to the Vosges Mountain. And, uh, <clears throat> After uh, rescuing the lost battalion, the unit was so decimated that they were sent back to a rest camp down in southern uh, France until they reconstituted themselves and then were sent back to Italy under General Mark Clark. So uh, the, the beauty of the whole thing is that the 442nd is known by the United States Army as the most decorated unit of its size. And one of the generals said that they don't think that any other unit in the future they will surpass that, and so far none has. Uh, in 1946, uh, I graduated in June. When the war was over. My brothers came back from Italy alive. Uh, the GI Bill was going to expire October 15th of 1946. So two of my cla uh, a classmate and I, in August, uh, volunteered and joined the Army. And our classmate made fun of us and said, you're crazy, the war is over, what do you need? And I said, well, we're going in for the GI Bill. And <clears throat> talking to the recruiter, I volunteered for three years because he said, if you volunteer for three years, you can get into the uh, segment that you want in the Army. So I said, well, I'm going to get in the Medical Corps. And I said, sure, guaranteed. Took my basic in, in Hawaii and was shipped overseas. Temporarily stopped at Incheon, Korea to uh, uh, release some Air Force personnel. And then from there, I went to Yokohama. 
and then went to the replacement depot in Zama. And there, all of the Japanese Americans, uh, those with Japanese surname, were interviewed by two Japanese American interpreters who spoke to you in Japanese, and you had to reply in Japanese. And after the interview, somehow <clears throat> they said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, you're not going in the medical corps. You're going to be in the intelligence service, and they sent us to a language school uh, about six train stations north of uh, Tokyo called Moji, and there they taught us uh, Japanese uh, military terms. And then from there they sent us to our assignment where I spent two years in, in Japan before I came home on an emergency leave. And since I had seven months left, uh, I, they wouldn't send me back to Japan. And he said, you have to have at least nine months before we can send you back. So he said, why don't you extend your enlistment to 18 more months and we'll send you back to Japan. I said, thanks, no thanks. <laughs> From there, <clears throat> uh, I was discharged and later applied to the University of Hawaii where I spent two years studying and then transferred to University of Cincinnati where I graduated. So that's that's my life. <laughs> <laughs>